It's time to deconstruct the episode with Catherine Knight. The Catherine Knight episode, woo, that got into a lot of sensitive issues, didn't it? I know that many of you out there are struggling with this work from home. How many days should we be in the office? How many days should we be at home? What should that policy look like? And she certainly covered that in a lot of detail. And she also talked about performance reviews. And she is going into a far more innovative place with performance reviews than most traditional automotive companies. I can assure you of that. So to join me to deconstruct the Catherine Knight interview, I have asked Nassim Malik to join me at the microphone. And Nassim is the managing partner at MRA Global. And he is a, a true thought leader in the space of executive search for supply chain. And it might not surprise you to know that I actually met him during my supply chain days, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But Nassim really is a thought leader. He's got his finger on the pulse across multiple different industries. And that's why I wanted to bring him to the show, because he can speak to automotive and manufacturing. He knows it, but he can also speak to what other companies are doing out there. And so often we, we live in our little silo industry and we don't look at what other industries are doing. So please join me in welcoming Nassim Malik to the show. Nassim, welcome. Nassim, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jan. Appreciate it. This is our second deconstruction episode, and we are going to deconstruct the previous episode with Catherine Knight. And again, to clarify, that is not the Australian murderer. Oh, no, 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 no. Catherine Knight is indeed the chief HR officer. She is head of legal and the chief compliance officer for Mitsubishi Motors North America. And she is out there. She is leading the charge in the automotive industry. So before we dive into all the meaty stuff that I know we want to tear apart uh, for the audience, uh, let's explain who you are, Nassim, and how we know each other. Do you remember when we met? Yes, I do, actually. You were, and I've often told this story, you were the, my first executive uh, female at the VP procurement level that we placed since we uh, started our company. So you were wow. one of the first, Jans. You'll the always be very one. special. You were the first uh, uh, vice president of procurement that we placed. How can I forget? Wow. Well, I am, I am honored. And for those of you who don't know, Nassim Malik is an executive search specialist. Now, what I love about Nassim is, of course, not only did he place me in the uh, senior level procurement role and put me in the C-suite for the first time, but he, I trust him. I trust his, his opinions, his perspectives. And he is focused primarily in the supply chain space, but here's the thing, across multiple industries. So he knows automotive, but he also is able to address the subject of work from home and all the things that we're going to tear into from the Catherine Knight episode. He sees it from the not only the perspective of somebody in executive search, but across multiple industries. And that's one of the reasons, Nassim, that I wanted you on the show. No, and it is uh, it is a highly um, relevant and a very timely topic. It stays, it continues to stay that over the past two years. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's continuing to change. So I'm uh, looking forward to getting into it. Well, let's do it. Let's dive right in. Work from home forever. The headline said, Automotive News, May 2022. One of the reasons I wanted Catherine Knight on this show is to say, all right, six months later, what's happening? You still doing it? And yes, she is. And for those of you who have listened to the full episode, you'll, you'll understand why. So Nassim, share with the audience, please tell us. What are you seeing from other industries? In my mind, Catherine Knight is clearly leading the charge in automotive, but what are you seeing in other industries? Yes, she is definitely leading the charge. So I would be remiss if uh, I didn't mention um, how fantastic that interview was, right? Very informative, very insightful, and um, just very fun to listen to. So great job uh, to both of you on that. And she definitely is, especially, you know, and, and her company, Mitsubishi, at the forefront when they talk about um, work from home forever, because even within within the industry, right, there's been some back and forth, uh, whether it's uh, automotive or manufacturing, 
uh, about, hey, we need to have uh, X number of days on site, right? We're moving. Um, the new normal now is the hybrid. So there is no new normal. It's a changing normal. And for now, it is a hybrid schedule of three days on site. You have to be there three days. You can pick which days you want. Some companies say, some companies say, no, we're going to tell you which three days you will be on site, right? But then you get into this whole other issue of um, how do you manage that? How do you get the right people in at the right time so you can have those meetings, those creativity uh, bursts that you need um, to help culture as well, to all these things. But going back to the automotive sector, um, her points were, were spot on, right? That this is something that if you can figure out a way how to make this happen uh, without affecting productivity, without affecting culture, and leading um, from the C-suite down and showing how it can be done, it can, you know, it can be rewarding. Um, and yes, it can be done. Now, what makes uh, Mitsubishi u- unique, I think, here, and why it was uh, such a treat to listen to you know, her describe this, is a lot of the companies that we've seen that have been successful in this realm are the ones that were digital natives pre-pandemic. And what we mean by that is a lot of the tech companies, right? A lot of companies that were, let's say, much more globally distributed, um, working in that remote environment. For them, it was an easier lift to make this more of a permanent thing versus those companies that are considered to be a little bit more archaic or a little bit more stodgy when it comes to um, how they're set up, um, how they operate. So it was it was refreshing to hear that, hey, there is a way that this can be done, and this is how you do it. What is it, do you think, that's in the mind of the leader in, as you say, the more archaic kind of company, right? So companies that have been around a long time, not so much in the tech space, manufacturing companies. I mean, they may not be automotive, but what is it? What goes on in the head of that leader that says, I got to pick something. It's got to be some number of days. What's driving that, do you think? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And it, if nothing else, it is just a... Uh, uh, fascinating study into just psyche, preferences, um, idiosyncrasies, whatever the case may be on how some leaders, and I'll give you an example. There's some leaders that were dead set against uh, ever hiring anybody remote pre-pandemic. And these are leaders that were 30, 35 years into their careers that would never entertain that because either they're in a good spot, meaning geographically, they don't need to do that, or they just didn't believe it could work. Um, and to see them do a complete uh, 180 and now hire successfully remote uh, was an eye opening. Uh, was an eye opener. And then on the other side, you have industries where, um, let's say, within manufacturing, a um, a dominant theme we've seen is uh, the private equity world. Within manufacturing, zero discussion there. Right, you have to be on site. And some of it makes sense if you're in an operational role in a manufacturing role. Yeah, you've got to be there. You've got to spend time there. But even for some of the other roles across, you know, the operations functions or engineering and supply chain, uh, they've been adamant that you have to be there um, every single day. You have to be on site and you even have to relocate. Um, <clears throat> so this is most of 2021 and first half of 2022 where, you know, the rates weren't that high and relocation was still on the table far less now. And then. The third, uh, the third element we've seen over the past few months now, as the pendulum continues to swing between you know companies and candidates, and just overall the market, which continues to stay tight, the labor market is on the financial services side, and this has been an interesting one. Financial services side in a lot of the major metropolitan cities, so it could be financial services, um, you know, not just fintech, but insurance companies and others like that. They have now also changed their tune, and uh, we've got several instances we're seeing of companies saying, you have to be on site. Now, there are some that are saying, if you look at the hedge funds of the world, they're, they're still very much five days. Uh, you have to be in the office every single day, and they compensate you accordingly. Uh, but then some of the other fintech insurance, those folks are now saying at least three days. So the challenge then becomes is over the past two years, when you look at some of the younger millennials and the Gen Zs out there, especially on that generation, to say, for us, it makes no sense. So we've been productive. Businesses didn't go, fall off a cliff. America was still productive when we were majority of us were working uh, remotely. So why are you now saying we have to be on site? So, and these are the, the folks that are um, 
uh, that are mandating this, they're not all gen, uh, you know, like me, Gen Xers, or even um, the Boomer generation. You've got some of the um, some of the older millennials and some of the younger Gen Gen Xers saying the same thing. So it is really fascinating to see this whole spectrum across the board of um, you know what the preferences are and how they're trying to drive their company's culture. You know, I, I've I've heard two things coming back from Gen Z. You know, I, there's a school of thought that hey, we're Gen Z, we know how to handle the tech, we can work from anywhere, right? But then I'm also hearing that Gen Z, hey, we're new in our careers. We want to be in the office. We want to know how this stuff works. What, what are you seeing? I mean, you're right at the forefront of recruiting. So what, what are you seeing as companies try to reach out to Gen Z? You're absolutely right. And there are very much those two schools here of um, even within Gen Zs. Now, the ones that uh, had worked a year or two prior to the pandemic versus those that started their careers in the pandemic, big difference. And here's what I mean. The ones that had started um, before the pandemic, even if it was a year, year to two years, they saw some of those benefits of FaceTime, meaning building those relationships, developing that rapport with fellow peers, understanding the company's DNA a little bit better, right? So they were able to at least get started on that. Now, those Gen Zs that started in 2020 till now, and have not had to go into offices, for them, it's a different ballgame. And yes, those are the ones, Jan, that are saying, we actually miss that camaraderie, right? We miss, we don't know what you're talking about when you say, oh, this creative uh, benefit of being together, of being able to you know, problem solve together, um, to be uh, able to build that trust and that confidence. And like it or not, there is still the element of FaceTime and you know helping your career Right when it comes times for assignments or promotions or or situations like that, so they are feeling some of that and saying, "Hey, we do miss that." Right, or even at a social level, whether it's uh, going for you know happy hours or team building events. So, how do you make up for that? The virtual digital world has accelerated tremendously. There's no doubt, but there is still that longing for that uh, that human interaction. Yeah, and I know from. My experience, I love the flexibility of working from home, but I will always choose face-to-face -face every time because but that's just who I am, right? That's my personality. That's how I like to interact with people. I, I like to engage in the room. I like to to read all the body language. I, I mean, it's just, it's just me. But, you know, not everybody thinks that way. I, and one thing I've noticed is a huge switch, and that is – this idea of a cookie cutter approach and a policy for everyone isn't going to cut it anymore. You know, it, go back in automotive decades ago, it was, well, this is the policy. You know, you'll be in the office from 7.30 in the morning to 4.30, and that's a policy. And then you get so many days off and so much vacation, and we treat everybody the same. And, and that was the way that we thought we were supposed to operate. But now I think we need to be more accepting and more inclusive. Inclusive is a word that gets a lot of airtime these days. But we have to be more understanding that, guess what? Humans are different, and our needs change at different times times of our lives. So are you seeing, I mean, I see that as a, as a fundamental switch in the way in which we approach culture and the HR function. Yeah, absolutely. And that is something which is far from settled, all right? As we are now, um, if you look at the overall market, right? The so market is still strong. You still have almost a million more openings than you do have a um, number of people um, that are either applying or that are in the labor force. So when those dynamics stay that way, uh, it is still the onus is going to be on companies to be able to um, find, attract, retain those types of uh, talented individuals. So I can tell you, Jan, that for the past 18 months, I, almost 24 months now, minus the last, I would say, quarter, that was one of the top uh, two questions, maybe three, that a candidate would ask us. It wasn't so much, you know, once another company it wasn't, oh, what's the comp? Who am I going to work for? Is what's the work arrangement? Is this on site? Really? Is this hybrid? So if it was an on site, it was a very short conversation for majority of those candidates. And those companies that continue to say, no, we want, you know, we don't care. This is what we want. They struggled. Um, they struggled to find people, not just people, but they struggled to retain their people. 
right? Because the inherent advantage that you had of, let's say, there was this e-commerce in, in the middle of the country that is doing great and almost a billion dollar company now. And they were, you know, they insisted that there are hundreds of people have to be in this small town over the past several years. Um, now, after the pandemic, as people moved all over the country, there was a lot of other people that had moved into that town. People that worked at other companies like Amazon, Facebook, Google, right? Netflix, they're now also living in those areas. What do you do now? Now your people can go work for those companies because they're living amongst them. So that really opened up eyes to say, hey, you can't continue to say that we will only hire in this town, meaning you have to relocate. So, you know, all bets are off now because now it's you've got to find uh, the people where you can and figure out a way how to make that work for those companies that were doing that. Now, uh, another key element to this was uh, compensation. Companies experimented saying, well, if you're going to go live there, then we're going to pay you wages um, that are in line with where you're living geographically. That didn't go very well either because, again, your competitors can hire those great people and pay them what they're paying. So you're going to lose, uh, you're going to lose out from that way. Is there still a war for talent out there? Is it still real? It is. It is. Now, some of it's been obscured with um, a lot of the noise we're seeing over the past couple of weeks coming from these tech companies. Now, these tech companies grew at a unbelievable clip uh, during the pandemic. And because of that, they hired. Now, they're all coming out and saying, sorry, we overhired. Right, so you've seen Meta announce a 13% cut, right? Over what 11,000 people um, that they're uh, that they're basically laying off. Uh, you've had other uh, tech companies saying if they're not laying off, they're freezing hiring. So that gets a lot of airtime, but it doesn't take away from the fact that overall the fundamentals, when it comes to menu, if you look at the uh, ISMs, the manufacturing sector or the services sector, it's still it's expanding, but at a um, at a diminishing rate, right? So. Now, demand has begun to soften just a little bit, uh, which means that, yeah, there's now going to be a little bit more pressure being released when it comes to deliveries and inventory and uh, being able to get your products. But companies still say that, you know, the the fire to hire ratio, right, is uh, is still in uh, in positive uh, positive terrain when it comes to hiring more so than firing. So. Yeah, there's still a lot of openings there, and there's a lot of factors. People didn't come back into the job force. People retired. People took gig gig jobs because the gig economy grew, uh, or people just want to be independent contractors, right? So all of those is still creating a pressure um, in uh, in the market. But yeah, right now, there's a little bit of bloodletting going on with the bigger tech companies, and once that settles, it'll... Uh, you know, we expect that it will uh, it'll har- harmonize a little bit. Mm. Well, let's talk about uh, General Motors for a moment because uh, we saw you know, Mitsubishi came out with that announcement, and um, General Motors uh, very much all about work appropriately. So where wherever you you and your manager deem that to be the right place, that works. And then General Motors came out and said, "No, no, sorry, we we." We want to, you know, and they always say this, these companies that want people back in the office, right? Oh, we want teamwork and collaboration, which I don't, I don't disagree with. I mean, I, I, I love all of that, but it's when you mandate, people want choice and it's when you mandate three days a week, that's when it gets to be like, yeah, I don't, oh, I don't want this. So what's your take? You know, GM saying January, you're back in the office three days a week. Is that going to hurt them? I think it's going to, <clears throat> it's relative, right? So it's probably going to hurt them less than uh, it probably hurts, uh, I would say, other companies that don't have that kind of pull that uh, GM does, right? And a lot of it depends on uh, from a geographical area as well, too. So if you're in Michigan, right? So if these are a lot of the, uh, you know, the white collared uh, staff roles uh, there, I think uh, it's becoming a little bit more of a norm that people are expecting that, hey, you do have to come into the office and three days is becoming more and more acceptable for lack of a better, uh, better term. So that isn't as it isn't as undesirable as it was, let's say, early uh, first quarter, two quarters of 2021. Right. Mm-hmm. It's something that is becoming, OK, yeah, we have to do this. Right. So if you look at 
what GM is doing, compare that with uh, what Tesla does, right? Tesla says you have to be there every day. Not just that, but the uh, inimitable owner of Tesla who now owns uh, Twitter, what did Musk just announce uh, for Twitter um, two days ago? He said every Twitter employee has to be on site 40 hours a week. I don't care how many days it takes you to get 40 hours, but you have to spend 40 hours a week in the office or you won't have a job. So what's, what he's doing at Tesla is now doing at Twitter. So that's probably more of an outlier. But even uh, move, uh, move over to Apple, right? Apple said, yep, we need three days, uh, three days on site. And even though they had a petition, I think over a thousand employees signed the petition saying, why? Why do we have to come on site three days? We want to continue this. Uh, but Apple stuck to their guns and said, nope, we're keeping this. Same with Google. Uh, Google had you know, brought back a lot of folks as well. And they're saying, yeah, we'll do a case-by-case basis. But even they're saying. And now with, uh, with the impending layoffs, with the, uh, the challenges that they have, with their overstaffing, guess who has the leverage now? So that's, um, yeah. but you know, the other interesting thing uh, that uh, tracks what's happening with these on-site versus off-site is uh, office uh, vacancy, Jan. So this is another interesting statistic to keep, uh, keep on the radar. So I think over the past uh, six months of this year, office uh, vacancy has declined, meaning occupancy has gone up by several percentage points compared to this time last year. So that shows you another trend of how companies are now beginning to say, all right, uh, slowly but surely, it's time to start coming back. Yeah, I, and there's no there's no right or wrong answer to this, I, I believe. I, and I, I'll go back to a comment that Dr. Andy Palmer made uh, when we had this conversation about the California EV tech culture versus the traditional automotive Detroit culture, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like the Detroit culture, you know, we, we want more of that California tech culture. But and he put me straight on this. He says, "You know what? It it's it's not about that. It's about as a leader and of a company saying this is my culture, and it may have elements of the traditional manufacturing culture to it, and it may have elements of a California tech culture. There's no sort of cookie cutter or either end of 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 this spectrum. There is what you decide it to be, and that's what leadership." Is and I think sometimes we forget that we think that we got to be you know all one way or another and, and you don't as a leader you get to define the culture and nobody else. That's exactly right. And there are as you were saying that an instance comes to mind. So there's a client we've been working with this year, a startup. Um, it's a stealth uh, tech company that continues to grow rapidly because a lot of their work is going to be a mix of uh, U.S. and overseas. And as they built out their team, Jen, as they hired their, you know, their chief supply chain officer and then built out all of his team from, you know, top tech companies and other industries, they were a 100%, um, it was a non-negotiable, it is completely remote. And they've hired people all over the country. And, you know, some of them are, you know, backgrounds when it comes to the Teslas of the world, Robinhood, Amazon, Google. You know, these, uh, these top-tier tech companies, and they've got people from West Coast, the Midwest, to the East Coast, and there's no question that as they've built up to hundreds of people that this is how they're going to run their company. And over the, as they've built their company, there have been people that have said, well, you have an office in California, you have an office in Seattle, can we come there? Can you build one here? And we're like, well, those offices are for engineers, Sometimes the engineers want to get together and they want to brainstorm and they want to do things that they feel are better in person. So, yeah, we'll give you an office, but you don't have to come to the office. We're not mandating it. And if there are some people that say, well, we want to move there or we want to be in a place where there is an office. Otherwise, we're not as productive. Then, sorry, you're not going to work here. So that has been very interesting to see. So we've had extremes. We've worked with that extreme where they have to be remote. And then we've seen the other side, as I mentioned, the private equity. But then we've we've worked with other traditional Fortune 500 companies, executives, either in transportation, logistics, or in the med device world, or in discrete manufacturing, that would never 
have entertained this and are now to the point where their office is less than an hour away. And in two years, this one chief procurement officer hasn't gone back to the office. No need to. All right? They've got a team locally, all remote. They've hired people, different parts of the country. They prefer to keep it within their time zone or one adjacent time zone. But they're completely comfortable doing this and say, why should we go in? And this is somebody that used to go into the office for over 35 years. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing to see as well. Well, we'll be keeping a very close eye on the automotive industry and we'll see where things end up. Um, but certainly it's great to see people like Catherine Knight leading the charge and, and just you know, not afraid to make the statement. Yes, of course, the decision was made as part of a leadership team at Mitsubishi uh, North America. But she's, you know, she, you could tell she owns it, right? She's that this is what we believe in and they believe in it to the core of their being that that's, that's what's going to happen. So as you listen to the entire interview with Catherine, obviously the work from home was just one element. What was it, Nassim, that really hit home with you in terms of her overall leadership? Because you... You deal with C-suite leaders every day. But what is it about Catherine that stood out in your mind? Yeah, she was compelling in a lot of different, uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, not just how leading from the front, right? How she talked about, hey, just because we're saying, okay, you can work remote, our leaders are not coming up to the office and giving a different message. Um, and that's something that actually um, uh, resonated with me because we do see a lot of that, right? A lot of these leaders say, and they're fine with it, right? And they're like, yeah, you can work remote, but we're going to come to the office, whether they feel they're paid too much to not come to the office or whether the culture at their companies uh, say one thing and do another. So for her to say, no, you know, we, uh, we, walk the, uh, we walk the talk, that was an important thing. So that was really good. And then the other thing, obviously, every, every other leader can relate to. She's like, I just have too many things I'd like to do. Uh, at the same time, so to be able to narrow that down, and then she talked about honing in on the performance reviews piece, and that also showed a progressive mindset in terms of how to um, how to truly take this head on, right? How this has more or less continued to be the bane of uh, a lot of people's existence, you know, this semi-annual slash annual ritual everybody has to go through that hasn't. Uh, hasn't been upended yet, but hasn't really been updated either, uh, is something that companies struggle with. So for her to describe what they're doing about it is, uh, is a great way to look at it. You know, it reminded me what she was saying about how, you know, it should not be a surprise um, and it should not be that you're holding people accountable for things which they had no control, right? So we can revise the KPIs, we can look at the metrics and see that, okay, if there's certain things here, that they did really well, but certain things that in a different area, well, we're not going to penalize them wholesale. We can still find ways to give people credit. Um, I, I found that to be um, an excellent way of looking at it. Um, and then in terms of the feedback, that it shouldn't be something that's done on a, uh, it shouldn't be done from a scarce perspective. Oh yeah, you'll get feedback once a year or twice a year, or maybe even once a quarter is not enough. So another thing that she mentioned that was uh, that reminded me of something uh, that I just read, and uh, this was an interview in the Financial Times from a, uh, a person that had just uh, launched a startup. He's ex Microsoft, ex Netflix, and he mentioned that I will not have performance reviews in my company because I don't like it takes substantial time and energy and resources away, and the return on it is uh, is uh, suspicious right so why would i why would i invest this especially where i am now but the way he put it um it reminded me of the way uh, Catherine was talking about it. he's like look it's all about feedback it's about how often uh, are we giving feedback the type of feedback that we're giving so he's like it's a, it's analogous to um uh, from an athletic perspective is after a play is done a coach should give a player feedback right then and there. A coach is not going to wait after the season is over and then come back to that specific play and provide feedback because that completely defeats the purpose. So it's thinking about it as a player-coach relationship is constant feedback, is after every play, give that feedback. And you know, there's, other, there's been other reports and studies to show that your engagement 
motivation, morale uh, of your team members goes up if they had got if they have received feedback in as less than even a week, right? So if you have given feedback to your uh, team members in the past week, you will see that correspond to an uptick on their engagement in subsequent weeks. So um, I, I think that was a that was a powerful way to see the value here on how to do this the right way. Yeah, I I agree with you. And I I think back on my career, you know, I hate performance reviews, really. I hate (laughs) prepping for them. I hate being on the receiving end of them. Maybe hate's too strong of a word. But you're right. I mean, there's an awful lot of work that goes into pulling it together. And why? Why can't I just talk to my boss and just say, hey, you know, this is what I'm struggling with. Or can you help me with this? Or how are we doing? Uh, I mean, just little pulse checks. And like you say, after after a negotiation or after something significant that somebody's gone through, there's, there should be immediate feedback, not this waiting for every six months. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's done. I think performance reviews are, are over. But you tell me, again, you're on the front line. Do you see companies across different industries moving away from the traditional performance review now? I see now more and more every year the uh, the chorus continues to grow louder on <clears throat> this uh, this performance review um, discussion, right? Or to say, hey, it is inane in many ways, right? It is outdated. Uh, why can't we make this more objective? Because you're right. Part of why people... Um, dislike this so much is because it is subjective, right? And if you haven't coached or trained your leaders on how to do this effectively, or if you don't have a really robust way of um, of executing this, there's a lot of subjectivity that comes into it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so what's next? Is it going to be AI? Is it uh, is it AI that will ultimately? Uh, take this away from us and move it into a different realm and we could be like okay we're done with that Um, that sounds good sounds like it may be uh, beneficial but then there's this whole other conversation around the perils of what ai picks up accurately and what it does not so it's one of those careful what you wish for all right to say hey can't we automate this isn't there tech here that can take this off our plate yeah it'll probably be here sooner than we think but are we going to like it (laughs) I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> well, what I liked about Catherine's take on performance reviews, she's focusing very much on the how. You know, she's she's recognizing, yeah, of course there are metrics, of course there are KPIs, but she's talking about the how and about behavior. And a lot of people will say that in leadership, but to actually do something about it and actually change the performance review system, that's what I love about her. She's, she puts her money where her mouth is. You, did you get that sense from the interview? Yeah, and it was, um, it was well articulated as well that, hey, there could be people that are, let's say, toxic to the culture. There are people that are really good at what they do. But you know, to your point, the behavior part, um, as you two had that discussion, is how do you deal with that, right? How do you deal with those let's say, difficult personality types that are creating this toxicity within the team or within the department or even within the company. And if you don't take that action, then it reflects poorly um, on a leadership perspective. So, you know, have those conversations, make sure they understand the values, make sure um, why uh, they know why their behaviors are falling short. But then most importantly, as you two discussed, is you have to take action when you identify that. If you don't, then that lip service that you give to all the other folks will be highly demoralizing, to say the least. Yeah. And what's so surprising with Catherine, right? She's talking about work from home forever and then the focus on performance reviews, on the how. And she's a lawyer. Let's not forget that fact. (laughs) She's almost the last person that you would expect to have this type of view uh, which I believe is very progressive and forward thinking and extremely innovative. But you would expect with her background and she's chief compliance officer. So with all of that, you'd think she'd have the, the like a 35 page policy on work from home and performance reviews. And she is not because I think she's she's a leader for the future. 
She really is. And those types of, as you mentioned, right, those types of functions that she's overseeing, it's legal, it's compliance, it's uh, HR, it's communication. I mean, it's almost like she is being uh, prepared and, you know, absolutely, why not to be, um, she could be a future CEO, right? Because the exposure she has across the company, right, the uh, the ability to lead, uh, the ability to uh, put these things in place and to understand the business from all of these different facets, I think sets her up um, nicely that uh, if that's something that she wants to do, there's no reason why at some point she couldn't, uh, right? She couldn't be uh, heading up, uh, heading up an automotive company herself because a lot of those traits in leadership is what um, is what is going to continue to help Mitsubishi thrive, right? As I was listening to her and how, you know, how her mindset is and when it comes to, even when you guys talked about the talent part up front, right? And how, you know, you can now find people from all over, but within, you know, obviously they've got some requirements within Tennessee and, or hire people within those areas, but just that mindset of knowing how to attract and uh, retain was uh, was really good to hear. It almost made me wish that, yeah, this is, these leaders like this make uh, what we do a lot easier because as you know, as we did with you, is a lot of, uh, a big part of what we do in selling an opportunity isn't just the name of the company. Yeah, that helps. Some names are better known than others, but a bigger part also is the person they're working for, the leader, right? <laughs> yes. What is she about? What yeah. is her style? What is her track record? Uh, how does she lead, right? So a leader like that, um, they have a big advantage in uh, continuing to uh, bring on great talent just by virtue of uh, how she's leading her organization. Yeah, and you, you heard us. We joked. We said that if we were not in the places we're at today in our lives, we'd be running a, a record store in Nashville together. And I, I mean, you know me well enough. You could totally see me doing something like that, right? <laughs> you mean you don't do that on the side yet? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> But what, but what I love about that is, you know, Catherine is very comfortable in her own skin, right? And she has a unique look and a unique style. And music, you know, features heavy in her background and, and her life. And she's okay with that. She'll, she'll talk about that. She has this long, long black gray, um, I'm sorry, long, long black hair with like a gray streaking it, mm-hmm. in it, right? It's, it's, it's very unique. It's fabulous. There's lots of people that would not do that in the corporate world. And I, I'll tell you something about, about being comfortable in your own skin and the look that we project and the mold that we think was supposed to fit. I was at an OESA conference last week, and they had three purchasing executives up on stage. They had Zeusk, they mm-hmm. had um, GM, and Ford. Okay. Now, they, of course, they got the, the pictures, you know, on the slide behind them, right? So the Zeus guy has got a T-shirt, and I don't think he, I don't know if he had jeans on, maybe, but a T-shirt, very relaxed, you know, very comfortable in his own skin. The GM guy, buttoned up. The lady from Ford, all buttoned up. It's like, d- just let it go. Break the mold, people, right? There's this corporate image. Of course, there's a level of professionalism, but it's okay to be you and, and to, to let your authentic self come through. In fact, that will do more for you in bonding your team to you as a leader than it will trying to fit a corporate stuffy mold. Don't you think? 100%. And, you know, if after the pandemic in which um, many things changed, the least of which was not attire, if even after that, you're still projecting an image of a buttoned up suit or in more of a formal um, outfit, even in sessions like this, then that's that's unfortunate because if there's one thing that you can take from here is that people's, uh, when you look at the on the dress side, it relaxed quite a bit, right? Well, now there's this whole other school of thought, oh, so it went too far, it got too relaxed. Yeah, that's fine. It depends on the industry, depends on what generation you're talking about. But even in a lot of the... T- uh, the manufacturing world, in the automotive world, a, a great way to show yourself to be that, as you said, authentic and even approachable is don't wear a tie. Take the tie off, right? <laughs> right? Okay, you, want, you feel comfortable with the sports coat? 
keep a t-shirt on and put a coat on it. Fine, right? But you don't have to be yeah. so stuffy. You don't have to still yeah. project an image of, you know, the late 20th century to show professionalism or competence. Um, so I like how you said it is be comfortable in your own skin, right? Now, you can still be professional. You can still um, exude authority and confidence and competence by being dressed in a, a casual way that you're comfortable in, right? So not sticking to whatever the conventional wisdom is about, oh, this is how you have to be on stage. So you're right about that. So And, yeah. and you're right about how not just Catherine, um, you know, the way she carries herself, but even for her, um, I loved how you got her to open up on her taste for music. And I think that stumped her more than anything because she loves <laughs> it so much, right? I mean, that question you asked her about your top five, right uh albums or artists of all time that was that yeah. was tough for her because she is such a music uh connoisseur and lover that she's like how do i uh, how do i uh, narrow it down to five yeah no she's uh she's got a great personality and she's not afraid to show it and that's what i absolutely love because you know over the decades that I've been in the automotive industry I, and i've said this many times i've had to throw a blanket over my personality to conform or to assimilate into a culture, to be what they wanted me to be. And it's probably only the last, what, 10 years or so that I finally said, forget it. You know, this is who I am. Yeah, I am a little bit edgy. Yeah, my my opinions and views are not conventional. They may not fit the mold that you think I should be fitting, but this is this is who I am, right? And I will be raw and honest and open and direct. And it's just not for everybody. And I just can't wait until we get to the, the day where everybody can come to work and truly be who they are and contribute in a way that's meaningful, not be afraid that they're going to get their head chopped off or they're going to be fired and that they're respected. They might be that person who is as quiet as a mouse because they're thinking. But when they speak, everybody needs to listen. I can't wait until that, that world of work happens, Nassim. How far away are we from that happening? <laughs> well, we, uh, everything uh, was accelerated post-pandemic, right? Whether it's technology, whether it's trends, whether it's um, new companies that have sprouted up. So what you're talking about, this world of work, um, that, that journey is uh, very much underway. And uh, those companies that recognize the value of uh, a broader, more inclusive, as you mentioned, set of workers are the ones that will continue to have a very serious advantage. I mean, there's now such an emphasis on, um, hey, just because you're an extrovert and you're, you know, you're more outspoken or more in your face doesn't mean you should get more airtime in meetings. Right. There are extremely intelligent introverts out there that don't say much. Like you just said, they'll speak. Yeah. Um, um, they'll speak less, but when they do, it's very impactful. So, how do you get them uh, more engaged or more involved, right? How do you not? Ma how do you make sure their voices aren't uh, uh, aren't drowned out, right? So, um, and now as more and more of the younger generations come into the workforce, right, they will lead the charge because they will ask these questions, right? They will challenge some of these uh, old ways of uh, thinking and just ask why. And why not? <laughs> right. So yeah, yeah. we better be prepared to uh, answer those questions. The same for the audience out there, uh, automotive leaders, all different levels in the automotive industry that are listening to this and are perhaps listen to the Catherine Knight episode and they want to be more like her. Right. So they, they want to be more forward thinking, leading edge, innovative when it comes to people. They They want to step out there. They've got some great ideas deep down inside of them. They just don't quite have the guts or the confidence or whatever it takes to break the mold and, and do what they believe is right. What advice would you have for them? It would, uh, advice would not be too dissimilar to what you just said a little while ago is to just be your, uh, be your raw self, authentic, right? Uh, find your voice and don't be afraid, um, to share it, right? Ultimately, we and we talk about this a lot is you are your own brand you've got to build your own brand right so if you are not um honest with yourself and the way you act feel everything it'll be reflected it'll uh, it'll stunt your growth it'll stunt your development and it may create an impression about you which is not reality so 
Look, if there's one thing that's uh, changed over the past couple of years is people have uh, taken stock of their lives, their careers, their priorities, um, and have said, a lot of them have said, hey, you know, we're not all just work. We're not all just um, certain things that we work on or care about, right? This is who we are from a holistic perspective. So my advice would be is to share that, right? It could be something as simple as uh, putting more content out um, in the digital world or creating your own website or if they're lucky and they're good they can come on uh, your uh, podcast on automotive leaders right and get that uh, um, you know get that uh, advantage or, or get that boost I should say um, but whatever it is that you feel comfortable do it right express yourself express your thoughts because what you're doing, it's it's creating your own, and this is something that I've been a proponent of, is creating your own personal monopoly, right? Find the intersection of what you're good at, of where you feel um, that you can add the most value, where you can help folks, where you have that um, advantage that you can share and you can pay forward. So once you've established that personal monopoly, um, you build your brand around it, then you've got to give yourself voice to do it because end of the day, you do work for yourself. Remember that. It doesn't matter if you're with a company, any automotive company, you work for yourself and you owe it to yourself to be able to get your voice out there and written and speaking in podcasts, but find it whatever forum you like and, and build on that. That would be my, uh, my advice. Wow. Great words of wisdom right there from the man who's at the front line of all the action. Uh, all the culture changes, the future of work, uh, the scene. Malik, thank you very much for joining me in this episode of The Deconstruction of Catherine Knight. Thank you so much. 